Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and taking good care of yourself. This video is focusing on the events that were alleged to have occurred during March 2015, and there are a lot of branches from this and many connections to be made and lies being told. By the end of it all, you should have a very detailed idea of what actually happened. Recently in the UK, the judge presiding over Johnny Depp's defamation case against the Sun newspaper called a hearing to decide if the trial originally set for March 23rd would be postponed. Johnny's team was fine with this decision, given the current COVID-19 pandemic sweeping the globe. The Suns team was not as understanding, using the caution being displayed to call Johnny a coward and saying that he just knows he'll lose. Throwing that caution to the wind, they said Amber would move heaven and earth to travel to the UK to give testimony no matter the health concerns. By the way, California cases of COVID-19 are still climbing, making it at least the third or fourth highest confirmed cases by state in the U.S. as of making this video. Also, if Amber is so eager to go to the UK to testify in the Suns case, why is she continuing to try to have her own defamation case actually here in the U.S. dismissed? Thankfully, as I began editing this video, it was finally denied. The Sun also said that she could give testimony via video call, and the judge thought that assessing key witnesses through all these different methods would be most undesirable, and I agree. I mean, did y'all see Amber struggle through this video of her 2016 testimony, eating and storytelling her way to not giving yes or no answers? I can only imagine if she were to hit a bump in answering questions through video call, it would be like... I actually want to use this video to debunk what the Sun said in this hearing. They've made a habit of using hearings to read aloud small portions of irrelevant text between Johnny and friends or family from various points in time to attempt to throw mud at Johnny. Knowing that by reading these snippets aloud, they can skirt around the privacy of the UK court system and get the media to run with their sensational headlines. This time, they chose to focus on snippets that they believe prove Amber's allegations surrounding March 2015. They also added to Amber's previous allegations, but lied about events and even dates in doing so. I plan to prove them wrong using real evidence, testimony, and facts. As many of you know, the main argument between the two sides is who was the abusive one and who caused the injury to Johnny's finger in Australia, which left a large piece of the end of his right middle finger severed completely off, while also having the bone in the end of the same finger broken. The Sun believes they read texts that prove Amber's versions of the events, including these snippets they claim prove that Johnny injured himself. I believe they're wrong and desperately reaching. Of course, by now, I'm sure you've heard this audio confession, recorded in the same year, but just months after Johnny's finger was injured, the audio in which we learn Amber admits to abusing Johnny, hitting him, punching him, throwing pots, pans, vases, and cans at him while simultaneously getting angry at him for running away every time and not staying, and then mocking him and calling him a coward for not wanting physical confrontation. For the sake of this video, let's continue to try to figure out why the Sun keeps sticking their collective necks out for Amber and have now willingly lied to the UK court when they clearly know all this evidence against her exists. One clue, and perhaps the biggest one as to why, I believe, is contained in one of the pieces of text they read in the recent hearing. In the summer of 2016, while Amber was publicly attempting to destroy Johnny with her allegations of abuse, he was texting back and forth with a close friend, Christian Carino. In one text, the Sun read aloud, in which Johnny refers to Elon Musk as Mollusk, he tells Carino, she is begging for global humiliation, she's going to get it. She sucked Mollusk's crooked dick, and he gave her some shitty lawyers. This seems to me that Johnny is thinking Elon was backing Amber during the divorce and Amber's initial allegations. A statement from Adam Waldman, an attorney for Johnny, leads me to think he could still be doing just that. He stated that the son didn't even realize how much profound truth the text they chose to read aloud contained. He continued, Johnny was speculating that Elon was secretly helping Amber with her abuse hoax, adding that the Murdochs owned the Sun newspaper, and a Murdoch serves on Elon Musk's Tesla board of directors. I decided to look into that. It didn't take much looking to make the connection. James Murdoch, son of Rupert Murdoch, who owns News Corp, which owns the Sun newspaper, is on Tesla's board of directors as one of its top investors. Interesting. So why would Elon still be helping his ex-girlfriend Amber, who he did officially date for some time after her divorce from Johnny? Believe it or not, the answer could tie all the way back to March 2015, and maybe further. You see, Johnny might have good reason to suspect Musk was helping Amber. You might recall how quickly she moved on with him soon after her public allegations against Johnny in the summer of 2016. Amber was spotted out a number of times with Musk, like in his hotel room while they were together in Miami, or even a club in London. Employees at the Eastern Columbia building also testified to Musk being a frequent visitor of Amber's at Johnny's penthouse in LA when Johnny was out of the town or country. 
Alejandro Romero, who worked security for the building, testified these visits, occurring a few times a week, happened late at night and overnight as his shift was from 4 p.m. until 1 a.m., at which time Musk would still be with Amber in Johnny's penthouse when Alejandro's shift would end. How far back does Alejandro remember these late-night visits? You guessed it, March 2015. He testified that it was around that time Amber would come to him late at night, asking him to let her friend Elon into the parking garage. Eventually, Amber would actually provide Elon with his own key fob for the parking garage and Johnny's penthouse elevator. It was during this time that Alejandro recalls Johnny being out of the country filming the latest Pirates movie and thinking of how wrong it seemed considering he and Amber were married. He also specifically remembers these visits from Elon occurring when the news hit that Johnny had injured his finger in Australia in March of 2015. Recently, the Daily Mail ran a story with photos of Elon and Amber riding in Johnny's penthouse elevator. Amber appearing out of sorts, in my opinion, attempting to cover what could be her naked body with a throw or a towel while the two lovers snuggle close together. Not sure when this is from exactly, but it does add validity to the testimony given by the building staff that Musk was a frequent visitor, as this is the elevator that goes to Johnny and only Johnny's penthouse. They certainly seem comfortable, like this wasn't a one-time thing. Before we get to the next claims made in court by the Sun's lawyers, let's get a brief-ish rundown of what each side claims to have happened in March 2015. Last year, in Amber's first motion to dismiss the defamation case against her, she filed a lengthy declaration changing details surrounding previous allegations of abuse and adding more allegations to the pile. One such new incident was March 2015. I won't read or break down the entire thing. I'll save it for another video, but if you want to read it, you can find it on the Fairfax County website or just Google Amber Heard motion to dismiss. Amber claims that she arrived in Australia on March 3rd to be with Johnny while he shot the fifth Pirates movie. She says that sometime over the next few days, Johnny went on a sleepless, three-day alcohol and ecstasy-fueled bender, physically abusing her daily, each night ending with Amber barricading herself in a bedroom to sleep. The last night of the alleged continual physical assault was extremely detailed. Amber claims that by nightfall, Johnny had hit her multiple times, shoved and pushed her to the ground, choked her and spit on her, busted down a door to a room she had locked herself in, threw cans and unopened bottles at her, and even handed her a bottle, which she claimed she only threw on the ground as she refused to throw it at him, even when seemingly challenged to do so. The abuse she alleges occurred later that night only got worse. She claims Johnny pushed her onto a ping pong table, causing it to collapse under her. Then he ripped off her nightgown and choked her against the fridge. This would continue into the night claiming she was dragged naked and barefoot across the broken glass that covered the floor and countertops. She says that she would slip on the glass and be slammed against the countertop, constantly struggling to stand as her arms and legs and feet were repeatedly slashed by the shards of broken glass. She says that while Johnny had her by the neck and collarbone as he was repeatedly hitting her with the back of his closed hand, that he also smashed a plastic phone against the wall and a piece of that plastic phone is what caused his finger injury, and then that she eventually escaped and barricaded herself in a room again and went to sleep. Didn't call or run for help, didn't bleed out, just went to sleep. Johnny claims a completely different event and circumstances led to his finger injury, all caused by Amber. He also denies harming or assaulting Amber and denies going on a three-day alcohol and ecstasy-fueled bender. This testimony is in a publicly available declaration, also on the Fairfax website, or you can just Google Johnny Depp declaration. Details were added in an amended filing in the UK courts, but nobody has those as those are not public, although some details were reported in some media outlets. Johnny testified that after his lawyer discussed with Amber the need for a post-nuptial agreement, she went berserk. While attempting to avoid her, he went to the downstairs bar area and started pouring himself vodkas and drinking them after having not had any alcohol in at least a year. She immediately followed and started throwing bottles at him, the first of which missed, sailing past his head and breaking the mirror behind the bar. She then threw a large vodka bottle which slammed and broke against the countertop where his right hand was resting. Upon impact with the counter and his finger, the bottle smashed, slicing off the tip of his middle finger and shattering the bones in it as well. After cutting off his finger, she would then take a cigarette and put it out on his face. 
In shock from the injuries, Johnny would go throughout the house using the blood from his injury and paint to write messages on the walls and mirrors. Not sure if any other property damage was caused as a result of his shock, but just speaking for myself, I can't blame a guy for finding another outlet to vent his frustrations and not harming the one he loves, even in retaliation. And I know it's nice to see visuals to better understand what happened, but it's also nice to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. So here's Johnny describing that very incident. I mean, because I, I basically I had a pretty nasty injury. Uh, uh, um, that I actually, I, I, I had to um, protect her at the time. And so I said that it was caught in the door, one of these, these huge accordion doors at this house. That wasn't the case at all. Um, she, she smashed, uh, she threw a vodka bottle at me and my, my hand was uh, resting on the marble of the bar like that. And the first bottle went just past my ear. And the second one was a larger bottle and she threw it from about this distance. And it smashed into the bar, which, and, and this, this finger, who I now call Little Richard, uh, <laughs> um, was, was uh, the, the, the tip of the finger was severed and the, the, all, the all the bone in here was, uh, completely shattered. I mean, it's, it looked like Vesuvius. And then I got infections. I, I, I ended up with MRSA twice, so it was very complicated. I, I was trying to just get the finger back, you know, um, and, and then deal with the insanity of having had my finger chopped off by, by this woman that I was married to. Yeah. See how easily the truth flows because, well, it's the truth. Now, a big dispute at the moment between the two sides is not only who caused Johnny's injury, but also when it occurred. At the recent hearing, the son added to Amber's claims saying that she was also sexually assaulted as well, with Johnny allegedly grabbing her breast and mocking her in the midst of this assault. But here's why I know they're lying. The son's claims match Amber's. You know, the ping pong table, the bottle throwing, the tearing off of her nightgown, the choking against the fridge, grabbing her neck and collarbone and slamming her against the countertop. These claims, all initially alleged by Amber, are said to have occurred on the same date and time that Johnny had his finger injured. However, the son lied to the courts and told them that this occurred on March 4th. Johnny's attorney, Adam Waldman, stated that Johnny's opponents are so caught up in their lies that they can't even get their fake sequence of events, times, or dates straight. And he's right. Johnny's injury occurred much earlier in the day, before lunch, actually on March 8th, not late at night on March 4th. After suffering the injury, Johnny was taken to the hospital just a few hours later, received treatment for the injury, and was released the same day, but would not see Amber again while in Australia as she flew back to LA the following morning on March 9th, returning to Johnny's LA penthouse, and Johnny would fly back a few days after, but stayed at his West Hollywood home to heal away from her. The son's lawyers read text portions from Johnny to his doctor, Dr. Kipper, which they say support their claims of the when and how of the injury. The first piece of text in which even their team says was sent shortly after the injury occurred, which they claim was March 4th, reads, I cut the top of my middle finger off. What should I do except, of course, go to the hospital? I'm so embarrassed for jumping into anything with her. Fuck the world. I believe they'd like you to think that this means he admits that he personally cut his finger off and was embarrassed for jumping into anything, which they hope you think means physically assaulting her. The next piece of text they say was sent to Dr. Kipper two weeks later and reads, Thank you for everything. I've chopped off my left middle finger as a reminder that I should never cut my finger off again. I love you, brother. Johnny. Of course, the son takes this dark, sarcastic joke of matching his left finger to his injured right finger as proof. We'll expand on these lies and awful attempts at mudslinging by the son in a bit. But I like actual proof, real evidence, witnesses, and patterns to establish the truth of when and how this finger injury happened, along with other telling pieces of information regarding this event. With that said, let's look at Amber's witnesses from March. Okay then. 
She did submit these pictures as evidence of her claims. We have two messages Johnny wrote on mirrors and scarring on her left arm that she claims is a result of the alleged abuse. First, let's talk about these messages. Johnny and Amber both say that he wrote on the walls and mirrors. Amber claims these are the only two pictures she could take because the mirrors were in the bathroom that was in the bedroom she barricaded herself in on that final night. She claims Johnny wrote the messages overnight while she slept. So, first question... How did Johnny get into the bedroom to write these messages on the bathroom mirrors if she was barricaded in all night? Next, both Amber and Johnny say that he wrote in blood and paint following his injury. And that's it. Blood and paint. I think Johnny's shock-induced handwriting is obvious here. One message reads, starring Billy Bob and Easy Amber. This is allegedly referencing Billy Bob Thornton, who co-starred with Amber in her smash hit London Fields and also in the film Friday Night Lights her breakout role when she was 17 years old. The other mirror has a message from Johnny that reads, She loves naked photos of herself. So modern. So hot. Citing Amber's vanity. But here we have something different. The handwriting is clearly different, and it looks like it's written in red lipstick, not blood or paint. I have a theory. I think this is Amber's message to Johnny in response. It reads, Call Carly Simon. She said it better, babe, with a little winky face at the bottom, referencing Carly Simon's hit song, you're so vain. And if I'm correct, who mocks the person who they alleged had just violently, physically, and sexually assaulted them? Allow me to expand on this theory. I think there are at least three separate or possibly a combination of reasons these are the only damaged photos she has. One, she only took these photos because she knew she helped cause a great deal of the damage elsewhere. Two, if Johnny was questioning her infidelity, perhaps other messages were a little too on the mark. And or three, after Johnny was taken to the hospital, she wrote this message as a response knowing she was flying out the next morning and it would be clean before Johnny could see it, so she took a picture to shove it in his face and get the last word in later. Now to her injuries. Why are there no photos of her fresh injuries? She claims she had a swollen nose, busted lip and slashes and cuts all over her body, arms, feet and legs. Also remember this from two weeks later in March when Amber claimed she punched Johnny to save her baby sister who had got between the couple when... One time, um, Johnny was hitting me and he was hitting me hard and repeatedly. But it turned out she threw things at Johnny, spit on him, and punched him in the face according to eyewitness testimony. After accusing him of cheating, ironically, soon after being seen sneaking Elon Musk into the building while Johnny was away. So, as far as evidence of these numerous and devastating injuries, now we're left to look for ourselves. Here she is, March 29th, at Heathrow Airport in London. Long sleeve, so you can't see her arms, but no cuts on her hands or parts of her legs that you can see. Plus, she has no sign of the recent facial injuries she claimed to have received. Also, she's wearing these stiff-looking shoes with no socks, no bandages, nothing. Three short weeks after she claims her legs, feet, and arms, and body were slashed. Then there's a throwback Thursday she posted on Instagram with a series of pictures from ballet training for the Danish girl, which Amber dated April 6, 2015. No cuts on her feet or legs, or even her left arm where she claims she has scarring. But here we finally see some skin surface cuts on her left arm while hanging with friends in New York on April 14th and again but beginning to fade a little on April 18th. Note in neither of these appearances with a good deal of skin showing does she have cuts anywhere other than her left forearm. None on her right arm, her chest, her back, her shoulders, her legs, or her feet. And here she is on April 21st, arriving back in Australia with Johnny, with her cuts now seemingly faded much more while he still sports a burn on his cheek and a bandaged hand. These similar cuts also pop back up on June 27th in London, and again, but faded a little bit, by July 4th in Paris. Now, I'm not going to say exactly what I'm thinking here, but I find it odd that Amber is right-handed. These surface cuts only appear on the underneath of her left arm are all similar in direction, length, width, and depth, fade in and out, come and go, but are allegedly from random sized and shaped shards of broken glass, which in my opinion would cause much more random markings, cuts, and gashes of varying directions, sizes, shapes, and severity. I mean, having your full body weight standing, slipping, dragged, and slammed onto broken glass and not one stitch? 
just four or five razor thin surface cuts on one side of one arm. Come on, have you ever seen Die Hard? Or you could just Google broken glass injuries, but consider yourself warned on that one. And honestly, now I can't get the message out of my head that Amber's mom sent to Johnny shortly after Amber accused him of abuse, saying that if they couldn't find a way to talk and work things out, that Amber might kill herself. Now to Johnny's evidence. He has pictures of the fresh injuries as he laid on a hospital gurney awaiting treatment on March 8th, the same day the injury occurred. Also this x-ray where you can see the bandaging and the broken bone. And there are countless photos online where you can still see clearly the deep scar on the end of his right middle finger. He also has witnesses who have already given testimony on his behalf. One witness is Ben King. He was the estate manager for the rented house the couple stayed in at Australia. Ben testified that he was urgently summoned by his colleagues to the house, and when he went inside, he said there was significant damage, specifically in the bar area on the lower ground floor. He testified that the mirror behind the bar was heavily cracked and damaged. There were broken bottles and glass on and around the bar. He was informed Johnny had his fingertips severed but was not told how at the time and actually found the tip of the finger on the floor in the bar area right where Johnny says it was cut off. Ben suggested to Jerry Judge, who was head of Johnny's security at the time, that Amber be physically removed from the property. Jerry agreed and Ben volunteered to fly back to L.A. with Amber the next morning. On the long flight back, Amber asked him something that, given the severity of the damage and the apparent injury to Johnny's finger, really seemed telling and has stuck with him since. She asked, Have you ever been so angry with someone that you just lost it? He told her that never happened to him, and not seeming to believe or accept his answer, she asked again, You've never been so angry with someone that you just lost it. He again answered no, and she dropped the topic. In my opinion, this was her trying to justify why she did what she did to Johnny, and if this sounds familiar... I can't promise you I won't get physical again. God, I fucking sometimes get so mad, I lose it. Then there's Malcolm Connolly, a witness and member of Johnny's security team tasked with getting him out of the house on March 8th. He testified that as he was taking Johnny to the car, Johnny said, Look at my finger, she cut my fucking finger off. She smashed my hand with a vodka bottle and that his finger was a mess and that Johnny also told him she put a cigarette out on his cheek and he could see the mark from it. Malcolm testified that Amber came outside, still wearing her nightgown by the way, and she was screaming at Johnny. Malcolm could see her face clearly and there were no injuries or marks on her face or her arms and she didn't appear to be in any physical distress. Johnny, however, was in obvious emotional distress and was panicked. However, he was not intoxicated and was standing on his own while having the conversation. Malcolm testified that Amber was screaming, Are you just going to leave like this, you fucking coward? Again, sound familiar? Then she would scream, I love you, I love you, is this how you're going to end this? He says she wasn't making a lot of sense. One second, begging Johnny not to leave, then screaming at him for running away that she was hysterical and Malcolm was worried she was going to throw things at him or Johnny as he had witnessed her do before, once witnessing her throw a fork at Johnny and another time a lighter and another time a can of coke. Once he got Johnny to the hospital, he knew they couldn't say Amber sliced his finger off because of the publicity, so Jerry Judge suggested they tell the doctors Johnny did it slicing onions. Malcolm thought the injury was far too severe for that to be believed, so he suggested that they say he jammed it in a car door. They ended up going with the onion story, but the specialist was not buying it. Once released from the hospital the same day, Johnny would stay with Malcolm and not return to the house for a few days, well after Amber had flown back to L.A. Which leads me to these next pieces of evidence that completely obliterate the claims the son made that this was a late night injury on March 4th. Remember this piece of text from Johnny to Dr. Kipper? The text the son claims was sent shortly after the injury and also claim it proves he did it to himself, even insinuating he was embarrassed for allegedly attacking Amber. Well, like I say, context is key. This text, even though originally sent in Australia, was extracted from a U.S. cell phone network, specifically from the L.A. area. So according to the data, the message was sent at 5 p.m. UTC-8 on March 7, 2015. Funny thing. LA, or Pacific Time, uses UTC-8 until Daylight Savings Time, which in 2015 was not until March 8th in the U.S. Queensland, where Dr. Kipper and Johnny were at the time, runs on a constant UTC-10, as Queensland has not used Daylight Savings Time since 1992, meaning if this text was sent at 5 p.m. LA time on March 7th, 2015, then the text, remember, sent shortly after the injury, 
was sent from Johnny to Dr. Kipper on March 8th at 11 a.m. local Queensland time, much earlier in the day and on a different day than the son and Amber have tried to now claim. Also, there's the discharge form from the hospital where Johnny received the initial emergency treatment. Note the date and time, March 8th, 2015 at 4.20 p.m., meaning he was indeed admitted and released on the same day and would return the next day for surgical consultation. Here you can see the doctor describing the injury, which he recorded as a kitchen knife accident, as Jerry and Malcolm had decided on. However, you can see that in the form, the doctor expresses his doubts, suggesting the injury was more likely from a crushing mechanism. Also, make note of the medicine used during the time Johnny was there. These two are simply numbing agents used for obvious reasons while they tended to his finger, and these two are just antibiotics to help fight off any potential infections. Notice what you don't see anywhere on this form? Any treatment for exhaustion, dehydration, which would have been severe if Amber were telling the truth. Also, nothing for the three-day drug and alcohol cocktail she claimed was in his system. Just some numbing medicine, some antibiotics, and sin on his way. Now back to this text. The son claims it proves he did this to himself. Well, first, let's read the whole text and get some context. It reads, Hi. Fucked, man. Had another one. I just cannot live like this. She's as full of shit as a Christmas goose. I'm done. No more. The constant insults, the demeaning, belittling, most heartbreaking spew that is only released from a malicious, evil, and vindictive cunt. But you know what? Far more hurtful than her venomous and degrading endless educational ranting is her hideously and purposely hurtful tirades and her goddamn shocking treatment of the man she was meant to love above all. Here's the real deal, mate. Her obsession with herself is far more important. She is so fucking ambitious. She's so desperate for success and fame, and that's probably why I was acquired, mate. Although, she has hammered me with what a sad old man has been I am. Cohen has done me the most cruel of favors. I'm so very sad. I cut the top of my middle finger off. What should I do? Except, of course, go to a hospital. I'm so embarrassed for jumping into anything with her. Fuck the world. JD. Now, with the whole text, I think it reads completely different. Not only is he saddened to think Amber is using him for success and fame and not love, he's clearly suffered abuse from her for a while at this point and is embarrassed that he jumped into a marriage with her, the marriage Amber said this about. The marriage I... I promise you. ...worked so hard to make happen. As for the proof that Johnny cut his own finger off, this ain't it. He clearly covered for Amber initially with the doctor and to many others long after which you saw him explain earlier in the video when he described how the injury happened and what he initially said to protect her. Just look at how many people covered for her. Jerry Judge said it was an accident cutting onions. Jerry Bruckheimer heard he got it caught in a car door, Malcolm's story, or a sliding door, Johnny's story. Media outlets ran with the story that he heard it in a go-kart accident, all to save Amber's reputation so the world wouldn't see her as an abuser. Heck, even Amber, who didn't even include this in her initial allegations, I wonder why, just days after making her public claims in 2016, leaked a story to Entertainment Tonight that she and Johnny had only gotten into an argument in March 2015, and Johnny punched a wall, injuring his hand and needing to have a pin placed in one of his fingers. Not even saying that he cut his finger, just punched a wall, a completely different story than the one she's trying to twist now. Here's another clip of Johnny talking about trying to heal from his injury and battling MRSA multiple times and discussing this fake story Amber leaked to the press soon after her abuse allegations. I personally don't recall any of that stuff. I was, I, I, when I was down or when the film was, or when I was off, uh, not being able to work because of the um, severity of the injury, I had to go back to Los Angeles and have surgery. Um, so most of the time what I was dealing with was just, uh, recuperating, you know, or, you know, or just, you know, I didn't want to lose the finger, because uh, MRSA, the MRSA, uh, infection is really mm, yeah. quite evil. Um, and I ended up with it twice, so I was really just worried about losing a finger or an arm or... Story about the bottle and then... Um, Amber, uh, you know, apparently created some story about you punching a wall or something like that? She says that I did it myself, yeah. <laughs> By punching a wall. Just another way to hurt you. I'd say, uh, I'd like to see the reactions from scientists. I mean, and 
physicians who are you know familiar with kind of you know uh, this sort of trauma, this sort of uh, thing, because I'd, I'd love to see her explain how someone hits a wall, and if they put their fist through it, that means that it's it's drywall or something. It's not. Well, you know, if you're going to go Barnaby Jones on me, I may go back at you with Quincy. In my opinion, this was to protect herself and apply more public pressure to Johnny shortly after her public allegations by getting out in front of any truth he would later claim, trying to make him fold. Johnny even sent a text to Dr. Kipper around the time of this fake story in which he again expresses his sadness and disbelief at Amber's claims and even talks to the doctor about how he told everyone something else happened to cover for Amber. Amber didn't even have anything close to this story until, lo and behold, she was questioned specifically about it during her August 2016 deposition shortly after realizing she was being asked about abuse she committed against Johnny, to which she unsurprisingly continued her pattern of giving non-yes or no answers. Isn't it true, Ms. Depp, I mean, Ms. Heard, that in Australia in March of 2016, you threw a, an alcohol bottle at Mr. Depp and in fact, when it smashed, you cut off the end of his finger with the bottle that you'd thrown. That's a ridiculous accusation. Then, after her deposition, wouldn't you know it, two days later, leaked a story to TMZ with his evidence photo of the injury from the hospital she didn't even go to with a story about an argument, again, not saying he was physically abusive, but saying he smashed a bunch of things and a piece of one of those things must have cut his finger off. A panicked, rushed story, in my opinion, right after knowing he was willing to tell and prove the truth of what really happened. It shows who Amber was actually trying to protect. Herself. She'll tell you she was the one trying to protect Johnny. Then why tell everyone, including your friends, that Johnny did all these alleged terrible things while she claims she did nothing? Why, even though she would later admit to it herself, to punching, kicking, hitting, and throwing things, did she tell completely different stories to her friends and so-called witnesses? Friends like Raquel Pennington, who gave a deposition in June 2016. She, at first, when asked about throwing things, has amnesia and claims to not remember Amber telling her that she had thrown things at Johnny, then flat out lies and says no. And then, of course, when asked about Australia, just says that Amber told her what happened because, of course, she did, but, like always, appears to have conveniently left out any of her abusive actions when twisting the story to her friends. I've cut this portion of the deposition down to parts solely pertaining to Amber getting mad and throwing things, something we know she did because she admitted to it. But don't worry, there's a lot to pick apart in Raquel's deposition, and I plan to do that soon enough. Because, in my opinion, she's just as guilty in what I believe to be an elaborate hoax, and I'm not going to let that slide. Uh, Amber has spoken to you about hitting Johnny, correct? No. She's spoken to you about throwing things, correct? Objection to state's testimony. Has she spoken to you th about Jerry throwing Charlie things? I don't remember. You don't remember? Correct. So you remember some things, but you don't remember other things about abuse, correct? Objection argument. Is that fair to say? Objection abuse is a broad term. You defined it for us, correct? Yes. Okay. Has Amber ever described to you her getting mad at Johnny in fights? Objection, Beg. Yes. yes. You understood my question and you answered it, correct? Has she ever said that she got mad at Johnny? Yes. Yes. Has she ever communicated to you that she's yelled at Johnny? Yes. And has she communicated to you that she's ever thrown anything at Johnny? No. She's never described to you throwing any object at John Depp. Objection Depp. asked and answered counsel. You keep asking the same question over and over again. It, I just want to be clear. Answer. We were very clear. And you I want to remind the, the witness that okay. she's okay. under oath. Counsel, you asked the question. You guys, the wait. Stop. <clears throat> I need you to talk one at a time. All right, I'm going to have to stop. Did she ever describe to you having a fight with Johnny in Australia? Yes. Did she ever describe to you about what she did in that fight in Australia? She described the entire scenario. Okay. Did she ever tell you that she had thrown anything at Johnny? No. Did she ever tell you that she had cut Johnny? No. She didn't tell you that? No. Notice when asked if she was told Amber cut Johnny in Australia, she almost looks taken aback by it. A face that says, wait, you're telling me she did that to him? 
Raquel would set for the second half of her deposition on July 14th, nearly one month after being questioned about this in June, so, of course, after what I believe was time to inform Amber what she was questioned about, she came back with a few more details. One of those being she claimed Johnny told her that he cut his finger off on a piece of glass. For starters, I don't know if I'm even buying Johnny told her anything, and honestly believe this little bit of information was just something Amber instructed her to say to protect Amber, of course. As I'll show you in upcoming videos, Raquel was instructed before she went to her deposition what to talk about, what not to talk about, and what she shouldn't bring with her, like her cell phone. That's right, someone told her to not bring her cell phone to her deposition so that Johnny's lawyers couldn't see text exchanges that she had with Amber about very important moments surrounding their accusations. Now, it doesn't surprise me at all that Raquel would possibly lie in this situation. There are a ton of them and other deceptive tactics throughout, and I plan to point out each and every one of them. Notice in this clip you just watched, she was reminded that she was under oath. I think lawyers tend to do that when they know you just lied. And that, kids, is called perjury. And the penalty for perjury can be some serious jail time. Something that I think, as I continue to break this down and facts come out, Amber and all of those who I honestly believe are her co-conspirators are not going to be able to hide from. But my point remains that Amber wasn't looking to protect Johnny at any time. Funny how if Johnny told a story about an incident, he would often leave Amber out of it entirely. Anytime he spoke about it, it was to protect Amber. Anytime Amber or her friends talked about it, it was to protect Amber. Notice a pattern forming? Amber didn't, and still doesn't, hesitate to make up as many conflicting stories as she feels the need to in order to keep the blame on Johnny, especially concerning one of, if not the most violent episode she had while in Australia in 2015. Fast forward to her not-so-fine-tuned version in 2019 that The Sun keeps adding to now and changing dates, lying to the court saying this happened on March 4th when they have clearly seen the evidence to the contrary, which begs the everlasting question, why? Why is the Sun newspaper willing to risk utter devastation standing by their initial article from Dan Wooten calling Johnny a wife beater? Why are they willing to recklessly lie so blatantly in court, making up dates and new allegations all to protect someone who, just over the past few months, has been repeatedly exposed as a liar and an abuser of multiple people? Why aid in something that people can see as a hoax? Why keep pretending when the evidence and the truth are clearly not on her side? Why does the sun continue to be? What gain is there in this much denial and dishonesty? But it is the sun after all. Do we expect anything other than this from them? Thanks so much for watching, guys. I think there's still more to pick apart when it comes to March 2015. A lot more clarity is needed. I'll either be adding a more comprehensive video to this next, hopefully really trying to dive into what actually happened on March 8th, or I'll get back on my comprehensive December 2015 video. I'm trying to make time for both, and I can't thank you all enough for watching, liking, sharing, and commenting. It really does help the truth get out. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones. I realize that my tagline might not be the best right now, but until next time, if there is a next time, take care.